Okay, so uh, I think from the last session we had, we spoke about fatherhood. And uh, the plan is to talk or have topics that are very relevant to us. So me and Tolu have a channel on YouTube. Not that I'm trying to promote my channel, but I might as well put it out there. Uh, and it's called Berean Workshop. And what we do is we focus on four Fs. Uh, we look at uh, fitness, which eludes me at the moment. So um, we talk about mental health, fitness. You know, everything that has to do with fitness is something that we address. We look at family, which is relationships and friends. And last, like last time, we spoke about fatherhood, which is part of the family dynamic. Uh, then we look at... Thank you. Faith in the context of, <laughs> thank you. Faith in the context of the faith and our faith, and then another issue, another topic, which is, in my opinion, a very serious, undermined topic, is the topic of finance. So, what I want to bring to the table today is, uh, let's talk about money. You know, uh, let's make it relevant. What does the Bible have to say about what you have in your bank account or uh, your wallet right now? So start with, let me uh, share a small testimony. I got saved in 1989, I was 16 then, so you could probably work out how old I am now. And uh, in my opinion, I was on fire, you know. I was evangelizing, I was starting youth groups, uh, I was doing all sorts of things, uh, kingdom related. My dad happened to be yeah, the equivalent of a bishop of an, or an overseer where we had, he had seven branches over him. So, Obviously, I'm familiar with that kind of environment. And uh, what I wanted to do, because I was so much in fire, is that I wanted to go to Bible school. That was my desire then. I was so much in fire, I thought, okay, God is calling me to go into ministry. And what ended up happening was that my dad refused. No, you're not going into ministry, you're going to uni. And you know why? Because we grew up in an environment knowing that anyone who went into ministry or became a pastor would be poor. It was a financial decision. Such a noble task like spreading the word of God was hampered, hindered by the fact that the thought of not having money while doing that would put me at risk and my future and my kids. So money is a big thing. It, it literally influences our decisions. 50%, uh, at least 50% of our working days, our, our days when we're awake, is spent making money. You go to work so that you can get something into uh, your account. We devise ways daily on how to invest so that we can have more money. Uh, I guarantee if anyone of you today has got a banking up on their phone, you've looked at it. Because money is important. Yep. So let's talk about money. The quality of health that you want uh, is dependent on what you can spend. The level of education for you and your kids, let's keep it real, depends on how much money you have. Okay, so let's move away from you. The ability to solve world hunger depends on money. The cure for cancer, money. Evangelizing the Islamic world, money. The paint in this building, money. These microphones, Money. The camera, money. The carpet that we need so much in this place demands that we have money. Jesus spoke a lot about money. Uh, read the book of Luke, the parable of the talents. A talent, by the way, growing up I used to think a talent meant a gift. You know, I'm gifted, I've got a talent. But a talent was 6,000 worth of denarii. A denarii was a man's, a laborer's day wage. So six, when he's speaking about talents, he's talking about loads of money. There was the parable of the minas. That's three months' worth of money. He spoke about the parable of the lost coin. When he talked about the, kingdom, uh, the parables of the kingdom, he spoke about uh, the hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, money. The prodigal son. The word prodigal itself means someone who's reckless with money. So money is something that is addressed seriously, in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 19. Money answers all things. Wow. Money's a problem solver. So if I lack a skill, I don't have a skill, what I do is I get the problem solver 
and I pay someone to solve that problem. Because why? Because money answers all things. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 7.12, for wisdom is the defense and money is the defense. Money gives you security. Money allows you, literally, I remember back in the Old Testament, you had occasions where two, war, two nations were going to war and someone would take, literally strip the house of God of all the gold and the silver and pay another nation to defend them. Let's bring it close again. When you go to court, you hire someone. Money is a defense. Proverbs 18, 16. Your gifts shall make room for you. So literally, again, I've always assumed, me being me, is that it meant I'm gifted. You know, I'm a beautiful singer. I'll end up on uh, Britain's Got Talent or whatever, because that's my gift. But what it actually infers was the fact that when you were to approach a king, someone of influence, you carried a gift to have access and a platform. Your gift gives you access. Your gift gives you a platform. The money that you have allows you to have a voice. If I have like, millions and tons of millions of dollars or whatever currency it is, I can go and buy time, airtime on ITV, two hours, and talk about Jesus. I'll pay them. They don't have a choice. You know, you've had men of wealth and repute who stand up and buy these platforms and talk nonsense and go make America great again. I'm not trying to be political, but all I'm saying is that money gives you access. It gives you a platform. So as Christians, we need tons of it. We need to be able to access those areas which we have felt. The Bible talks about us having dominion and being fruitful. The word dominate. The word dominion comes from dominate, of course. The word to dominate means we overcome. And believe me, in the world we live now, you cannot dominate anything without money. So we need money. So we just need to come to terms to the fact that uh, money is a very important thing and we need to talk about it in, in, in church. Let's bring it to the pulpit. So look at the power of money. Let me quote some scripture. So you've got the account of David and Goliath in uh, what is it, uh, Samuel 17. And what Saul does, King Saul does, is he incentivizes money. Money is, is an incentive. He says, the guy who kills this guy won't have to pay tax. That's, that's money again. Yeah? And uh, let me just share the story. Me and, again, I'm sorry, but, you know, Tolu's like my, yeah. So we, we kind of go through this. We look at it. We break them down into little bite-sized chunks, and we throw it out there. So at least we can analyze these stories biblically and have principles in which we can generate uh, this money. So let's look around Easter, the Easter story itself, and see how significant money was. There's a guy who's been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. This guy has seen it all. He's seen Jesus walk on water. You know, he's fed the 5,000, the 8,000. He's seen demoniacs being... Uh, uh, Whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah, literally being delivered. Uh, he's, uh, he's heard Peter. Peter say, oh, you are the Messiah, you know. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. So Judas Iscariot knows who this guy is. Three and a half years he's spent with Christ. But for 30 pieces of silver, he betrays his Messiah. Money is powerful. Jesus says something. He says, you can't save who? God and and money. He doesn't say God and the devil, no. On this earth, he says you can serve two powerful forces, money and God. Our mission is to be able to navigate that very fine line between the love of money and the need for money. Money is important. The tomb that Jesus slept in was bought by a guy called Joseph of Arimathea. He was rich. If Peter was loaded, he would have bought it instead of having this covert disciple pay for the tomb. The spices that Jesus was embalmed in. Do you know that there were Roman guards outside the tomb? Roman guards were standing and guarding. They saw the angels come and roll the stone away. They saw the resurrection. But they were paid off. They saw something that nobody sees. Who sees angels these days? Yeah. They saw something that was I mean, crazy. Yeah. And they were paid off to say that, no, we saw the disciples come and take his body away. Money is a powerful force. And that force needs to be in our camp, in the kingdom's camp. I heard a story of uh, a man, a very wealthy man, 
who used to throw these parties. And at these parties, they would offer up, uh, I don't know, a million of whatever the currency was, let's say a million pounds to the best dancer in that particular, at the party. And you'd have grown men contorting themselves with their teenage kids trying to win a million pounds. That's the power of money. So we've established that money is a powerful force. Money is not ignored, neither is the power of that ignored in the scriptures. So what do we do with it? You know, uh, money is something that we need to be able to preach the gospel, or it's something that we need to be able to survive in this environment. It's something that is absolutely important. So what's the purpose of money? There's a story in Luke chapter 12 of what is known as the parable of the rich fool. And this guy plants and he sows bountifully. So he has excess money. And he devises this plan. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to break down my bonds and build bigger ones then put everything I have earned and chill. No purpose. And you know what God says? It's always required of you today. Because money without purpose is exactly that. Money without purpose. It has no value. I think I'm pretty sure all of us know, have heard of people who have uh, won the lottery. And yeah, four, five, six years later, broke. Because that money had no purpose. It disappeared because no purpose. So money has to have a purpose. It has to have something that is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That is a type for whatever. It's a resource. It's something that you use to gain something. I would say it like this. Money is like a vehicle. It's like a car. It takes you from A to B. If you have a small car, you carry small stuff. If you've got a big car, you carry a lot. The more you have, the more you can influence, the more you impact. As a matter of fact, the bigger the vehicle, the more the training. That's why Joseph had to go through what he went through, because he was responsible for the economy of the world's most powerful nation at that time. So we all need somehow to be responsible for money, or we are all responsible for the money that comes through our hands. Determining 8.18 says this, it is the Lord who gives us the power to the ability to gain win. But it doesn't end there, so that, so that we may establish the covenant. So even then, he tells them that the Jewish people had this covenant where he said, I'm, I'm giving you an ability to accrue this, to build this, to have this, because I want it for a particular purpose, to establish the covenant. Money with a purpose is a very, very powerful thing. Solomon was tasked with uh, serving, or rather leading Israel, and he knew it was an overwhelming task. So it depends whether you read it in Kings or you read it in Chronicles. He's either asking for a discerning heart or he's asking for wisdom. One of the two. But what does God give him? He gives him discernment, wisdom. But he couples it with money. Because you're not going to function. In, in Ecclesiastes 9.15, it talks about a poor rich man. Oh, no, I lie. A poor wise man. <laughs> a poor wise man who delivered a city that was besieged. But then his voice was diminished. It lacked impact. Wise, but poor. No impact. Solomon, rich, wise, I'm still talking about him. Yeah. So we're looking at the fact that if we want to be impactful in life, we do need to have money. And what we are is we're kingdom people. We're kingdom-focused we're kingdom people. The Bible talks about the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed, which starts out small but influences. You know, it, grows, it grows to be this huge tree where the birds come and pitch. The purpose of our lives is to make sure that the kingdom of God influences everything around us. He talks about it being like yeast, which works through the whole door. You know, influence, impact. Yeah. When, again, growing up, I used to think ministry was about just preaching and standing in front of the pulpit. But I know now, that is different. Joseph was a politician who impacted a whole nation. In fact, the Bible says that this guy, the whole world came to him. So what we're looking for is prophetic politicians. We're looking for evangelistic managers, apostolic doctors. We want people who influence around us. And the only way we're going to do it is if we have this resource, this powerful resource. So uh, I've related it a lot to the fact that 
it's kingdom based. It's we focus on the kingdom, and that's what our mission is. But what about the guy who does the will of God? What about your pocket? What about your kids? What about your bank balance? The Bible says he became poor that we might become rich. In every sense of the word, I've looked at it. It is what it is. He became poor. Jesus is part of the redemptive work of Christ, where he became sin that we may become his righteousness. So he's done this, that we may become that. He became poor that we may become that. Uh, by his stripes we're healed. You know, he bore the pain so that we may be healed. And it's in the Bible. He became poor that we might become rich. There's another portion of scripture. First Timothy 5.17 says, The elder that works hard among you is worthy of double honor. Uh, I submit to you the word double honor there means uh, double pay. Yeah. So, Akin and uh, Nathan there demand that double pay. <laughs> it says the elder that does well, that works hard among you is worth of double honor. So you, you, you ought to be recompensed for your hard work. The man that does the will of God gets an incentive. David had to face Goliath, and the incentive was that the guy that kills that guy will get his money. When you do the will of God, you benefit from doing the will of God. Purpose. It says that there's another one. Same, same verse, next verse, 1 Timothy 5, 18. Don't muzzle the ox while it trades out the grain. Basically, don't keep a muzzle on, it, on the ox while it trades out. So it can partake of it as well. So that when you're doing the will of God, you ought to be recompensed. It needs to come and affect you as well. Jesus said a worker is worthy of his wages. And Abraham, Abraham, Genesis 13, Abraham was very rich in cattle, gold, and silver. Job was very, very wealthy. Talks about him having 7,000 camels and 3,000 this and all that. Excuse my French, Jacob was stinking rich. Isaac was filthy rich. David was extremely wealthy. Solomon was very, very, just King Jehoshaphat was rich. Joseph of Arimathea was very, very rich. So don't muzzle the ox while it trades out the grain. So you, you, you are obligated to accrue wealth. It's, for some strange reason, I'm also, if you look at, Christianity comes from the, from the Jewish religion. And the Jews understand that poverty is not a blessing. I don't know what, why we have it in our mind that uh, when you're poor, you're humble. They know that if you're wealthy, it's because God has blessed you. And somehow in Christianity, we seem to have separated those two, and we need to put them back together. So when the Bible says riches and honor are in the, I can't quote it correctly, but it's something to the effect that when you have wisdom, you have riches and honor. And you know, that esteem comes from an association with God. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. You are obligated to accrue wealth. Why? Because you want to leave it, not for your kids, but three generations down. You are obligated. A good man, I don't know what a good man looks like, you know, because I'm thinking none of us are good, but I'm going to assume that means a responsible individual or someone who is thoughtful will leave an inheritance for his kids' kids. So you are obligated to do that. You're obligated to accrue well so that it can impact to at least two generations. In 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, there's a story of this woman. So I, I just want to illustrate something. There's a, there's a prophet there, and he's passed on. And this woman, the wife, the widow, goes to the prophet, Elisha. And when she goes to Elisha, she tells him, so, um, you know your servant. Uh, he was a reputable man. So the prophet who's passed on was reputable. He was a prophet. So that means he was one seeing visions and dreams and really connected up to God. But now the creditors have come. They want to take the two boys to pay off the debt he left. So it's, it, there's principles to accruing wealth. It's not automatic that you are a good prayer warrior or a powerful faster or you know your scriptures you know, from the back to that automatically wealth begins to trickle to you. You can see it in this. This man was reputable. The wife would go to the prophet and say, this guy, you know him. He's got a powerful reputation. He's a prophet. He's a man of God. Principles have got no respect 
for you. Gravity is gravity. Profit or not profit. When you fall down there, you're going on the ground. Because principles that accrue money are principles that accrue money. So you are obligated, like I say, a good man leaves an inheritance. That means he has to apply certain principles to make sure that he can accrue. We've just seen that this prophet had left, I can't even, <laughs> he had left so much debt that they wanted to take his kids away. So what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that there's formulas uh, for accruing wealth in the scriptures. And what we've done on our channel is we've taken this, this portion of scripture, chapter Kings, no, 2 Kings chapter 4, and we've broken it into smaller sections and actually looked at how this woman got out of debt. Because by the end of the story, this woman is not only, not only have paid off the debtors, but she's got money to live on. And what we've done is we've broken it into small bits and actually analyzed. And you know where the Bible says that, uh, you know where the Bible talks about Paul, I Paul planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. Again, you see principles that demanded certain actions from both Apollos and Paul before we had the increase. And it's the same thing. If you look at that, the, the, this, or this woman had this little jar of oil which started to flow endlessly. And God was responsible for that. God is the miracle worker in the equation. But that was, this woman had to apply certain principles before she can do that. And this is what we endeavor to do in this particular um, this particular series, which we have titled the, the Elisha Project. And we look at it in, 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 in some depth and kind of break it down into these bite-sized, uh, uh, easily chewable principles on accruing money. I think I like, um, not I think I like, I absolutely love Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Because uh, again, it talks about, let me back up a bit. What the Bible doesn't do, it, it doesn't teach the tithing, as controversial as this might sound, the tithing is not a way of accruing wealth. It never has been. It's been mentioned a few times in the New Testament, twice to be exact. And it's never been a principle in which you accrue wealth for yourself. Um, the Bible says, honor the Lord with your, yeah, and the first fruits of your crops. So you give to God because it's your value system. You honor God with the first things that God blesses you. You know, then it, you look at that, that's your lifestyle. I love God so much, I'll give. It's your, it's your value system, it's who you are. But tithing has not been, I'll leave that. So, okay, uh, what the Bible does encourage is in, on how to accrue wealth is it, it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. And I'd, I'd love to read this. Um, So Ecclesiastes 12, no, sorry for me, I will find it. Is it 11? Okay, yeah, it says, uh, it says, cast your bread upon the waters and after many days you shall find it. It talks about investment. It says you have planned long-term investments. That's the key. The key in kingdom wealth, or what's taught in the Bible, is diversity in what you do. Yeah. Look at number two. It says, give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not when evil shall be upon the earth. The other, I think the other scriptures here, or the other version says, invest in seven ventures or even eight, because you don't know what's going to happen. So the key to kingdom accruing wealth is in diversity. When you look at uh, Genesis chapter 13 in the account of Abraham, it says that Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and gold. He invested in three things. He had cattle, he had gold, and he had silver. Look at Job. Job had 7,000 sheep. I'm going to assume uh, it was for wool. Uh, he had 3,000 camels. Let's assume that's for transportation. He had uh, 500 yokes of oxen. Agriculture, maybe. Don't know. Uh, 500 donkeys and a large number of employees. So you see diversity there. Uh, look at King Solomon. Um, I think one thing I learned from King Solomon was the fact that the first thing that he did after his dad died was that he, he connected up. He went to his dad's friend, the king of Tyre, a guy called Huram or Hiram, and then connected, started networking with this guy. And they started to barter, buying timber for building the temple. So you, you do need to network as well. You do need to have the right people around. You do need to know people who are make, making money. You know, we, we quote this scripture about the sons of Issachar. It says, who knew what to do, you know. 
And what, in, if you read the rest of the chapter, these people were attached to David. David allowed these 200 men from this tribe to be attached to him so that they can give him advice on what to do then. You know what I mean? You need to attach yourself to people who know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Yeah. Another thing that uh, King Solomon made a mistake was that in his efforts to be so networked, he ended up marrying, what is it, 300? 300, 700 wives? And all of them were, all, were princesses. That means he had a hand in other people's economies as well. You know, he had influence there. He had uh, connections there. So it's important for us now to enable to accrue this, uh, this resource, this powerful resource. We need to be connected. King Solomon battered timber. He traded in gold, silver, and other precious stones. He controlled what is known as the King's Highway, which was a major trading route through, uh, through Israel. He charged tolls and uh, taxes for other business people. He controlled merchant ships. Uh, he bought chariots and horses from Egypt, which he resold to the Armenians and the Syrians at a profit. That's King Solomon. Look at uh, Proverbs 1 talks about the virtuous woman. Look at the virtuous woman. The Bible says she works with her hands and she brings food from afar. She's into real estate. So she considers a portion, a piece of land, and she buys it. She's a seamstress. She buys and she, well, she works with her hands and she sells linen garments. The Bible talks about accruing wealth by diversifying our investments. We look at many things to do. Uh, there's a quote, I think an English quote, which says something, a jack of all trades and a master of none. But the rest of that says, uh, but oftentimes... Better than one. So you, you diversify. You're touching. This guy will be a master of one. He can do that one thing. But if you do seven things, even if you do 90%, you're still better than that one. That's the full quote. But because we've cut it short, we've just thought, no, you need to focus on. But he's saying, no, touch here. Do that. Do that. Invest. It. That one fails. I've still got six more. Mm. Um, yeah. And what we need to have, or what we do have as as Christians and men, is an unfair advantage in the marketplace. Or at least we should. We need to stay connected to God. This guy called Joseph sees 14 years into the future. Yeah. And what does he do? He begins to invest based on what God has revealed to him. And that's what we have. As long as we stay connected to the Lord, you know, you're praying, you're fasting, God begins to reveal to you those things that other people don't see. You have an unfair advantage. Just stay plugged in. You know, just stay in his bosom. And the Lord will start to show you things. Genesis chapter 26 is another account of Isaac. There's a famine in the land of the Philistines. And he makes a decision. He says, okay, I'm going to go to Egypt and run away from this famine. And the Lord says to him, no, stay. Stay here. So right here. In the famine, God speaks to him. And he tells him that you need to sow right here. We have an unfair advantage over those out there. We just need to stay plugged in. Um, I could cite another one. In Acts, Paul sees something about a ship he's on. You know, he says, you know, brethren, um, there's danger here. This voyage is dangerous to us and to our staff. And he begins to prepare based on what he knows. We have inside that information, and it comes from the Almighty Himself. Yeah. Amen. And we, we just need to plug in. Can you imagine if I had seen COVID? Oh my goodness. Yeah, right. If I had seen COVID, I would have invested in hand sanitizer, tissue, and what, what else? There you go. We'll all be laughing. Because you know when Solomon became rich, the Bible says God was as common as stones in... Jerusalem. Your wealth trickles to everybody around you. You know what I mean? So, we need to focus on the fact that we need to do this. We need to find money to be able to be effective in what God has called us to do. Um, yeah, so again, I repeat, what we do need is people in the workplace who are connected to God, prophetic politicians, evangelistic retail managers, apostolic doctors, Bible teaching lawyers, and pastoral school teachers. We need to be effective. We need to bring the kingdom of God on the earth. Amen and amen.